the Oklahoma City Thunder wrapped up their summer league session. What did we learn over the course of this marathon summer league sprint from Oklahoma City? We'll talk about that and your takes coming up on today's Locked on Thunder podcast. You are Locked on Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder Podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, and editor-in-chief over at thunderousintentions.com, Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LOTHUNDERPOD. Email the show at LOTHUNDERPOD at gmail.com. On today's show, brought to you by Prize Picks. Go there right now, and you can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. That's prizepicks.com, promo code locked on. We're going to dive into the Thunder's final summer league contest over the Spurs, including your biggest takeaways from summer league for OKC. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball, even in the off season. So subscribe and become an every day or that way you can never miss the show. What a game this was last summer league game for OKC. Summer League officially ends tonight with the championship. I believe it's the Rockets and the Cavs uh, playing for the title uh, tonight. But nonetheless, for this game, everyone was out pretty much. Chet was out. Of course, Jada and Chairman were already shut down. Jeremiah Robinson are all out. Jay Will out. Uh, Caleb McConnell was out with uh, the concussion-like symptoms from the broadcast uh, the game before. Said that he had concussion-like symptoms. I'd imagine that's the exact same reason why he didn't play today. Uh, and then Groves, Shaka Florida, and Malnado did not get minutes either. This game was obviously a very sleepy contest, and you know we're going to get into breaking down this game, but I want to start with your overall takes. The summer league takes that you, the listeners, have had uh, compiled for the last couple of weeks, and we start with Funky Sooner. Mark often puts out 11 to 12 players in a game. Could we see a 15-person rotation this season? Because of the depth. I think that that's still a bit of a stretch to be completely honest with you. 15 would be on a consistent basis would be wild. Uh, but I, I truly believe that, you know, prepare yourself for this Thunder team to play 10 to 12 guys a night. Like I, I know that people assumed um, that, that this would be a only this season thing and that, and that, you know, this coming year it would end and they, and they'd figure out a four, you know, they would figure out an eight man rotation or whatever. No, the, for the 82-game season, there are going to be DNPs for guys that you like. There are going to be, you know, many a minutes to go around. They're going to be shuffling through lineups. They're going to – I would venture to guess that the Thunder will play at least, you know, top five in the league most lineups this season because they're going to have so many options and want to get so many different looks – and explore this roster. And I think that you should count on that for the rest of time when it comes to as long as Mark's the head coach. I think exploring this roster is a great thing for the Thunder, and it can reveal things that you get to use in the postseason. I don't view it as some negative aspect. I know a lot of people did during the regular season, and I've been saying since then that, like, you know, without exploring the roster – you know, you're just limiting yourself on, on the data you can use in case you get into a pinch later on, especially in the postseason, especially as you're game planning for certain matchups. If they try to take something away from you, how would you counter that? You want to be able to have seen it before yourself. Uh, so, yes, I would agree with you to the extent of, like, he's going to play 10, 11, 12, 13 guys. Uh, 15, of course, is a little bit exaggeratory. I think that you meant it to be exaggeratory, but he will play a ton of guys um, throughout this season. At Thunder Wilker, Trey Mann has locked in another year on this roster. I, I I think that this is a hot take, not for any reason that Trey Mann did. Like, Trey Mann did his job. Uh, and it's a lot better to look good than look bad. I will always say that. Uh, so you can, you can have all the crutches and qualifiers that you want to. It's just Summer League, whatever, whatever. 
Uh, Trey Mann has never looked like this in summer league before. Like his rookie year, second year has never looked like this in summer league before. This is the first time he's ever dominated summer league. Uh, he did dominate the G League whenever he got sent down there in certain stints, but like not summer league. So I think it does matter. And, and, and the way that he was getting his buckets and the way that he was playing within the flow of an offense did matter. Um, but locking in a roster spot, I wouldn't go that far, but I think he did a good job of earning himself a spot on this team. You have to remember whenever you're talking about Trey Mann. Financially, there's easier options to cut. Not that he'd be a tough one to cut financially, because financially you could make uh, Trey Mann's cut number work. Um, but there's just something different about the optics and the narrative of cutting a first-round pick that you made. You know, the, the, the $3.1 million would be no problem to wave if the Thunder wanted to. But it, there's just something different about the business side of things of what you've invested into said player. So I think that people got to remember that part of it too. But also, you know, the Thunder have been preaching about competition, but also they want to see how Trey Mann reacts to this competition. Does it rise, you know, raise him up? Because everyone understands the Thunder do, Trey Mann does. Everyone understands like that last year was not a good year for Trey Mann. And so now when you bring in all of these players who are vying for spots, what does that do for Trey Mann's confidence? What does that do for Trey Mann? Um, his ability and, and, and ability to, to impact the game. So far, he's passed every test. Can he pass that training camp test? That'll go a long way. I wouldn't say lock in the way that Thunder Wilker did, but I will say he's vastly improved it from what it was after the draft to now right, with this summer league performance. At CG101, Chet being healthy is the obvious biggest takeaway, but Usman Jang's upside is exciting. Very much is exciting. Um, I, I think that Usman Jang, he tracked well last year. And I think that that gets lost because of, you know, how good you know, J-Dub was and, and how good the team was in general. But he did track well last year, kind of as you'd expect for a project player. Then in this environment, he played really well outside of the first game. Uh, and then this game, of course, his shooting splits were not good, uh, but I think that they were better than not. We'll talk about this game overall coming up. So we'll get there. But like outside the first game and then this game, stat-wise, he was fantastic. I test-wise, he was fantastic uh, outside of the first game. The entire time. A lot of Jared Butler takes. A lot of Jared Butler takes, which we're going to save to the end. Uh, but Brother Reed says, Kante Johnson can continue the tradition of a conversion player. So as you know, the Thunder typically have guys like Wiggins, like Lou Dort, uh, last year, Eugene and Lindy, and, and, and so on and so forth, of players who start the year on a two-way deal and then get converted to standard contracts. I would agree with you. I think that Keontae Johnson being the 50th overall pick um, and, and and the level of play I would expect for that, for him to have, I would agree with you that, that he's going to be able to do this, but I think he's the only one. And that's not a knock on, you know, whoever else ends up on a two-way deal. It's just a matter of roster spots. Cause once you cut down six players from this and you can pick your six that you want to cut down, once you cut down the six players that the Thunder are going to have to cut by uh, the season opener and cut a broad term for just move on from, once you get this roster whittled down to 15 standard contracts, in order to convert Keontae Johnson, you obviously need to cut a seventh standard contract or move on from a seventh standard contract at some point. And uh, I think it's doable between now and the postseason because that's when it matters, right? It's, there's no rush to this thing. If Keontae Johnson proves that he's worth um, playoff impact minutes, they will have moved on from one of the 15 guys and put him on a, on a standard deal that we can, that way he's playoff eligible. If he hasn't shown that, then they just won't do that. And they'll just keep Keontae on a two-way deal and he'll be ineligible for the postseason. But I think that you're right. Keontae has a shot to do this. The reason I say that no one else does, no matter who they put on there, even my beloved Caleb McConnell, even Jared Butler. The reason why is just that again, roster spots are a premium and you're not going to be able to, to, to cut seven, seven, eight, nine guys from this team for the sake of, a Jared Butler for the sake of a Caleb McConnell. Kanthe Johnson certainly I think is going to have that impact. I would be shocked if we go through a full year where Kanthe Johnson's not converted at some point, it's going to be, it's going to make the deadline interesting because you would imagine that at the deadline, they'll move on from somebody. If I had to guess, they'll move on from somebody at the deadline and bring back a guy like Casey, Casey Akpala, which they did a couple of deadlines ago, bring back a guy like Casey Akpala, easy, easy, easy number to cut. You cut them and then convert, you know, your guy from the two way deal. So I think that they're going to do that this trade deadline, if I had to guess, and that's how Kanthi Johnson will get the two-way spot. Uh, but he's got to earn it in training camp. He's got to earn it at the start of the season and with, with the blue, and I think he will. I really do. So I agree with this take. I think it's a good take. Kanthi did show a lot in summer league in this environment. 
you guys have a ton more summer league takes, including at K Ramichi. How are we going to make it until the preseason starts by listening to Lockdown Thunder? That's how. Listen to Lockdown Thunder for your daily fix. Check out Thunder's Intentions. We're going to get through this together. It's going to be a long process. Basketball is the shortest offseason of all sports, but for basketball fiends like us, it, it feels so, so, so long. But I promise you, we're going to get through this. Plus, we're going to have FIBA World Cup stuff with a lot of Thunder representatives, especially uh, we're all going to be Canadians come FIBA World Cup uh, to root on Lou Dort and SGA. So that's going to be a lot of fun as well. And then before you know it, it's media day and training camp, and we've got some big things planned for this season, which you will see very, very, very soon. Uh, we'll, you'll see that right before media day of what the big things are for this season. So um, stay tuned for that. But stay tuned to Lockdown Thunder. That way you are able to get your basketball fix. More of your summer league takes coming up. But first, I want to tell you right now about our good friends over at Prize Picks. Folks, Prize Picks to me just makes these games more fun to watch. Plain, cut, and dry. With Prize Picks, what you do is you go download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com. Put the code locked on in. You get 100% instant deposit match up to $100. And so if you get 50, you get 50, et cetera, et cetera. You pick any sport you want. They literally have it all. NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, men and women's college basketball, WNBA, soccer, esports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, disc golf, Euro basket, cricket, and more. Pick whatever sport you want. Then you pick two to six players, and you guess will they have more or less than their prize pick projections. You can earn 25 times your money on any entry. You can even do that cross, cross sports, not just within their own sport. So two to six players of any sport, 25 times your money. So you can sit down tomorrow and you can say, I think that Salvador Perez will have over one and a half hits and Bobby Witt Jr. will have under one and a half hits and then away you go watching the game that way just to have a little more rooting interest in these games that you're going to watch, especially as sports slow down. You want to you want to be able to have something on the line here when you're watching these sports. Check it out today. Prizepicks.com, promo code locked on, 100% instant deposit match up to $100. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every single day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen. Subscribe to Lockdown Thunder anywhere you get your podcast from. You can even text the show. So you know about Twitter. You can go at Ryland underscore styles. You can uh, go at LL Thunder Pod. But you can text the show 405-963-3686 at subtext, and we can get your takes and questions and talk ball over there all the time. Uh, or, you know, you get moved to the front of the line for mailbags. Your takes after every single game can be reacted to live on the pods. So you get a shout out there. Uh, you get the scoops. You get everything there all in one place over there at subtext. So let's continue on. So we've talked about Marsh rotations. We've talked about Trey Mann possibly locking in a roster spot. We've talked you know, a little bit about Jang. We'll do that more here soon. Um, Kathy Johnson looks stellar from Brother Reed from uh, Apatur Savah. Also said Kenneth Johnson looked really good. He did, absolutely. Let's talk Jared Butler. So at M Duke 05, Jared Butler deserves, deserves a two-way spot, and he made an argument for a normal spot. That is a big take. Roger, Butler should be getting more playing time. So, you know, if you listen to this podcast, I'm a big Jared Butler fan. The organization is a big fan of Jared Butler. I think he should be on the two-way spot, for sure. Of the two open two-way spots, he should fill one of them. So then you have Kathy Johnson, you have Jared Butler, and then you have one more open spot to delve off to whoever you want to. I can't get there on arguing for normal rotational you know, minutes and also a normal roster spot. Um, I think that Jared Butler's a really good guy to have in your system. Really good guy to have leading your G League team. Really good guy to have in a pinch uh, because as Sam Presti points out, I love the analogy of like twice a year during this 82 game season, the sky is going to fall on you. And that can be due to a myriad of things, but let's highlight injury right now. The Thunder have all this guard depth, but a couple twisted ankles for a couple weeks and, and you're down to the bottom of your roster. And so filling that roster with depth and talent of guys who can step in and guys who can fill roles like Jared Butler, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. You'd rather have too many guys who can play than not enough guys who can play. And so I, I, I vehemently agree that Jared Butler should be on a two-way contract. 
but I can by no means can get to a normal contract because a standard contract would mean you cut seven players for between now and October. That's just unfeasible. Uh, and I just don't think that he warrants one. I don't think he warrants one. I don't think that there's a demand for one. Um, I think that you can get him back on a two-way deal and it can be really good for, for both the Thunder and more importantly, the Blue, uh, to have a guy who can alleviate some pressure offensively off of you, play some solid defense, especially with Cam Woods' system, uh, and then orchestrate things and organize things for whoever you've sent down that day to develop, mainly Kathy Johnson. But of course, we've seen how the Thunder operate. They're going to use that, that G League system uh, to get minutes for guys who've, who've been DNP'd or who need to work on some things throughout the course of the season. So that's just going to happen. I agree with the Jared Butler hype. I think that, I think that he's a player who has gotten a little bit over-criticized by some uh, from, from this summer league. Uh, I think that he's done enough to deserve a two-way spot, but, but it's kind of the, the old adage of the truth is often in the middle. That don't get too high on Jared Butler needing a normal roster spot at him, Duco 5. Don't get too low where people have been just crucifying Jared Butler ever since he missed Chet on one pick and roll in which Butler scored on that play and then one no less. So it, it's oftentimes in the middle. Charles says Chet and J-Dub were dominant. Agree and agree. I think that Chet Holmgren, of course, will clean some things up as he gets more um, game shape, game ready, game repetitions. The, 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 uh, the handles were loose. A lot of factors with that. Handle was loose because of the ability to hound ball handlers in the summer league because you get 10 fouls a night and no one's going to foul 10 times in one game. Uh, obviously, he hasn't played in a long time. Obviously, he's not going to be asked to be a majority ball handler uh, in the NBA. So all that thing, all those things sort of contribute to him cleaning up that handle and limiting those turnovers. I think that the jump shot will come back. He, he's been a, he's been a really good shooter at every single level he's ever played at. Every single level he's ever stepped on, stepped on the floor, he's been a really good shooter, uh, including you know, in the NBA to extent last summer league, he's going to find it. It's going to be fine. Like got to give him time there. So overall, I agree he's dominant. I agree, of course, Jada was dominant in that one game, and uh, Keith Smith. Uh, on spoke track had a summer league notebook where he talked to people within the thunder. You can go read it. A lot of good stuff there. And, uh, and the thunder's openly admitted, Hey, he didn't, he didn't even need that one summer league game. But I think it goes back to what Mark said of like, that's the culture here of like guys in their second year, you're going to play like Josh played last year. Jay was going to play this year. Like you're no matter how good case is, he's going to play next year. Like guys in your second year, you're going to play uh, in summer league. And so Jada did play. Technically he played the one game was absolutely dominant. Uh, but Charles points out a leap from a leap from Usman Jang uh, would be awesome for this team, as did MK three two five four nine one. If Usman Jang takes a leap, OKC will be a great team. You know, it sounds crazy from the outside looking in. I don't think people nationally have caught up to the Thunder yet, and I don't think that they're, that they're going to uh, before the season starts. But you look around this roster, and like if Usman Jang takes a year two leap, he's working with Chip England all off season. Um, you know, it, you know, if Kaysen hits as an incident impact player in his role off the bench, if Michich translates immediately, like we all expect him to, uh, well, with along with you know Chet hitting and and Jada progressing, and Josh Giddy has continued to progress year over year. SGA, you know what he is. Like this team is quickly becoming one of the deepest teams in the NBA, a team that will take the regular season extremely seriously, a team that is going to fight for every single win, and one and one of the the premier teams at least in the regular season because of those facts. And so I could see the Thunder blowing their win total out of the water just because of the, the product of their environment of like, hey, we're taking the regulation seriously. Other teams are not. Also, we're a really deep team. So as I've mentioned before, I scratch my head at night thinking about how the Thunder could go a whole game and have just an off night because you have so many guys to rotate through to find a hot hand. I have to believe that night in and night out, you're going to find five, six, seven, eight hands that are hot that night. So that helps you win a lot of games. Now, I, I hesitate to, to go great in terms of playoffs because I do believe personally that you've got to go through the fire a little bit as a team. Uh, this is a Thunder team that is not game plan for an opponent. Like, like the Thunder continue to harp on the fact that they do not, you know, game plan externally, game, they, they game plan internally for these games. If you want to you know, live on that hill, then you're going to walk into a playoff series where you've never really truly sat down and game plan for a specific matchup. And the odds are you're going to face a team and a coach that have, and your team and coach hasn't done that yet. Uh, your team and coach hasn't made adjustments night in and night out in a playoff series. Your team and coach, you know, hasn't been through adversity together because everything to this point has been roses. And, and, and 
And if we want to live in this world where the Thunder avoid the play-in tournament and they get a top six seed or even better than a top six seed, you know, they finish top four or top five, whatever. If you want to live in that world, and to that point in the first round game one, this group will have never faced adversity. They were, you know, they, they, they were developing for a year, you know, a couple of years. Last year, they had an instant boom into the play-in where even after getting blown up in Minnesota, people were applauding them as they should, including myself, applauding them for, for, that, for that play-in journey. And then if you do get a top five seed, then all of this year will be roses and gravy and, and, and applause. What are you going to do when you get punched in the mouth the first time? And so I, I personally believe that like, like guys and teams have to go through getting punched in the mouth and oftentimes don't handle it in the sense of getting wins right away. Look at that Kings team. Like you cannot tell me that that Kings team was a bad team. They were a, a really good team all year long. They lost in game seven to you know the Warriors who have been there, done that, won titles. And so I can't go as far as to say they'll be a great team in terms of playoff success this year. But I do believe this team is deep enough to totally avoid the play-in tournament and, and, and could end up with, with home court, even in the very tough Western Conference. And that, that of course, is with everything breaking the Thunder's way. Uh, but I can get on that limb with you if you want to say a great team is in that kind of success. Playoff success is a little bit of a different ball game to me personally. But if Usman Jang did take this leap and kind of translated this one-to-one to the NBA, and not one-to-one in terms of box score, because he's not going to need to score you know, 22, 25 points a night in the NBA, but one of one in the sense of offensive force that he's played with this summer league, then I'm all for it. I- I'm all for uh, considering this a-, a-, a great leap for OKC. Coming up, we still have a few of your summer league takes, plus we're going to break down this game against the Spurs. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you, talking Thunder basketball. For your next listen, check out Lockdown NBA. I'm actually on Lockdown NBA today with Jackson Gatlin, uh, talking Thunder. So you can go check out that Thunder segment over there um, and also whatever else is on the docket for uh, the National Pod. We're going to be reacting to your Summer League takes today, and we have a jam-packed week ahead. Your mailbag questions on tomorrow's show. If you send them in, we'll answer them on tomorrow's show. So send them in right now on the YouTube comments. Send them in right now on Twitter at Ryland underscore styles. And if you want to subtext, subtext 405-963-3686, your, your question is moved to the front of the line. If you do that, along with all the other perks of subtext. So make sure you get over there again. Thank you for making sure first listen, subscribe, like, comment, review on all platforms. Uh, that way you never miss a show. And that way uh, we see your feedback. At M2 O Workman, I guess I should have said 20, but I'm an idiot. Uh, M- M20 Workman, the OKC Thunder 2022 NBA draft class could be one of the greatest draft halls of all time. Chet Holmgren looks like a depoy, and Usman is flashing potential. Jadab is an all star, and J Will is too good for Summer League. Let's work backwards. J Will has graduated from Summer League. I agree. Jadab could be a future all star. I agree. Chet looks like a defensive player of the year candidate. I agree. Usman is flashing his potential. I agree. The OKC Thunder 2022 NBA draft class could be one of the greatest draft halls of all time. It sounds crazy. I'll admit that. And if you listen to this podcast and you're not a Dire Thunder fan, I can see where you think that this is the, the, the wildest take you've ever heard. The issue here is that like Jadam could be like a legit future all-star. Chet is supposed, like we forget, Chet is supposed to be generational. Like the way we talked about Chet last year, was supposed to be generational. He was supposed to be the guy. Like this was supposed to be Chet's franchise last year. Like that's how people talked about him. And now he still has all that skill, but none of the pressure. He has all that skill. He's a basketball junkie who just loves the game and has gotten an entire year with a smart coaching staff, a smart organization, and and talented players around him to absorb and, and, and to learn from. So he's gotten to soak all that in like a sponge, and he heads into this year. All the pressure gone. Now, there's always pressure being the second overall pick. Absolutely. But defenses, like they did in Summer League, once October rolls around, defenses can't even hardly pay attention to Chet Holmgren because if you do that, oh, there's Shea open. There's J-Dub open. It becomes pick your poison to where now everyone's eating. Everyone is finding success. So, like, it is just a totally different vibe of what this year is supposed to be from Chet Holmgren than it was a year ago at this time. We forget quickly the conversations around Shea last year at this time. We forget very quickly. 
questioning if he's number one, questioning if he's an all-star, questioning, you know, if he can be the guy. All that's gone the way of the dodo bird right now. That's gone the way of the glass bottle milk right now. That is out the window. Shea's a top five MVP. He is, you know, first team all NBA. Uh, he's a first time all-star. He's a superstar. He's a max contract point guard. He, you know, he's everything. He's a 30 point per game score. He's everything. And so now Chet's not having to be the savior. Chet's not having to be what this all was for. What this entire rebuild tank was all for. He's not having to be that. He's having to be a complimentary player to a roster that went up in wins to 40, to a roster that made the play into a roster that uh, you know needs exactly what he provides. He provides shot blocking. He provides rebounding. He provides floor spacing and shooting. He, he, whatever, everything he provides with the Thunder sorely missed last year. And he's just going to fill in this gap now. And I think he has that mentality and edge to be a top guy, but he also has the, the wherewithal, the awareness, the um, confidence in himself, you know, the lack of insecurity to defer. This is a guy that like went to Gonzaga and deferred to Drew Timmy. Like no offense to Drew Timmy, heck of a college player. Drew Timmy is nothing in the NBA. He's not a top three potential pick. He's not someone who's been hyped up ever since they, they could walk. He's not somebody uh, who was one of the best players in high school basketball ever. Like he's not somebody like that. Like he's not Chet Holmgren, but yet Chet Holmgren was comfortable in himself and secure in himself to play with uh, Timmy at times through Timmy while also being incredibly effective in his role at Gonzaga. And so if he did that for Drew Timmy, he'll do that for SGA. He'll do that for Jalen Williams. He'll do that for Josh Giddy. Because he's going to be the beneficiary of it. He Who's going to benefit from playing through Shea, from playing through Giddy, from playing through J-Dub? It's going to be Chet. He's going to be the one rolling to the rim and getting spoon-fed buckets. He's going to be the one who defenses have to rotate late to. He's going to be the one who gets the N1. He's going to be the one who gets all these uh, flowers from it. And he is a smart enough basketball um, player to understand that where, where other guys might demand the ball, demand to be the, the offense ran through. He knows, Hey, it's nothing wrong with me. If we let this team get run through Shea, because I'm going to be the one benefiting. I'm going to be the one, you know, that, that sees my numbers increase and it, get, and it makes my life easier. So that's the power of Chet of relieving some of that pressure and also, you know, relieving, you know, relieving some of that duty that he had, a year ago and that pressure of being the guy he doesn't have to be the guy but he has the mentality to do both he has the mentality to be to be the guy he has the mentality to compliment the guy and that's why i think with this young core and all of its budding talents you're not going to see a ton of like in a house fighting or anything like that like, like these guys i think understand the deal understand that they want to win and understand how to win and how you win is by playing team basketball and making and forcing teams to pick, to, to defend and, and focus on one of you and then finding the open guy. And they'll do that. They'll do that. Thunder Talk YT. Usman deserves more minutes. Chet at center and sign McConnell. I think Usman will get more minutes this year. I think that, the, you know, they're going to continue to develop him. He was going to get more NBA minutes had he been healthy last year. Like, we forget that. Like, he was going to be bouncing back and forth between the blue and the thunder last year. By the time he got healthy again, though, it was tough to find him back in the thunder rotation because how close it was the season in, because they were rolling, because all those other factors. So I think that Usman will get more minutes. Uh, Chet at center. I, I totally agree with you. And, and I totally agree with this knock on the Thunder, like, hey, why are you playing Chet at the four? That really you know kind of neuters him and what he does well defensively. Don't read into that. The Thunder, I think, viewed Chet as a center. Like, the Thunder thinks he's a center. They want him as a center. They're going to play him as a center. The issue this summer was, hey, we've got Jay Will here. He's playing. We're not going to bring Jay Will off the bench for, you know, just a suing. I'm sorry. We're just not. We're not going to bring Jay Will off the bench for the Quan Plowden. I'm sorry. We're just not. So at that point, your hands are tied. You're, you have to play them both. And uh, I think that that was more of what you saw there. They're not going to be doing that a ton in season, I don't think. I think that Chet will spend the majority of his time as the main center. And then sign Kelly McConnell. I agree that Kelly McConnell, you know, if in, in my opinion – the, the two ways should be Kathy Johnson, obviously, Jared Butler, Caleb McConnell. That's what I would do if I was Sam Presti. Sad news is I'm not Sam Presti. If I was, I'd still be doing this podcast because I could be the best podcaster ever if I was Sam Presti. Like, think about that. If I was Sam Presti, I was doing this podcast, I could just tell you what's going to happen and be 100% right. And, and just like, basically just be Woj with a podcast and be the most listened to podcast of all time, make a billion dollars as a podcaster and a GM. That'd, that'd be insane. So I would still be doing this podcast about Sam Presti, but 
I'm not. And Sam Presti couldn't give a rip what I have to say. So bad news for us, I guess. Nonetheless, we're going to recap the Spurs game. Cason Wallace played really well today, in my opinion. And we're going to be talking about him and Kathy Johnson tomorrow. Usman Zhang, though, I want to do, I do want to talk about him before we go. Usman Zhang did not have like the box score that you wanted or like have been used to. Eight points, six assists, four rebounds, 0 for 7 from three, 3 for 11 from the floor. But it goes back to what I said Friday show. You want to just keep shooting. Like, just keep shooting, keep believing in yourself, keep playing with force, and don't be scared to, to um, you know, mix it up offensively. I will say one thing that I agree with some of the comments I got on Twitter about Usman Jang's game. I agree. You know, if he's going to be tasked with playing the small ball five, you've got to mix it up more inside defensively. I don't know if that's kind of a scared to foul thing because we know he's a good defender. Like, he's, he showed that at the NBA, much less G League, much less summer. Like, he's shown at the NBA he's a good defender. I think maybe it was more so like scared to foul, didn't want to like, didn't want to like, uh, cost the Thunder and one one try to try to play more planted basketball defensively. But, but yeah, if you're going to play small, you gotta, you gotta be more physical inside on defense for Jang. I don't think that this Thunder team will be small too often. And in the sense of like Usman's the reason why they're small, I don't think that they'll happen too much come regular season, at least not yet for him. And I wanted to highlight like the fact that he's getting creative offensively, like the step back threes. He's trying to like drive in and, and be like kind of herky jerky around the rim. I wonder if that's like instructed to do so by the Thunder. Because whenever these whenever the Thunder send guys to Summer League, and this is the case with every NBA team, whenever NBA teams send guys to Summer League, they say, hey, this is what we want you to work on. Remember the Terrence Ferguson point guard era. But then like they'll say like individual games, like, hey, tonight you better shoot 10 off the dribble threes. I, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care when you shoot them. But by the end of the night, you have to have you know 10 off the dribble threes. And it's going to look clunky. It's going to look terrible. Um, and, and the outside world won't really understand it. But that's what we want you to do. That's what we want to see from you because you're you're going to need these game reps with this specific skill set. It's all you know. You hear it more in baseball, more publicly because it's so long of a spring training, and you can actually um, ask guys. But like in spring training, like guys will only throw fastballs the entire outing because they just want to work on it because they want to see their command on a fastball. Uh, and it ends up with them getting shelled for like 15 runs because if you're only throwing fastballs to pro hitters, they're going to hit it. Uh, but they just want to see what it looks like and, and how does it feel of the hand. So I, I would say that with Usman Jang. And these step backs, I wonder if that's something that Thunder want to see from him more on ball, creating his own um, bucket a little bit. So maybe it is. Maybe I'm just stupid. Could be both. Could be one. Uh, likely just one. And it's likely I'm just stupid. Uh, Ty Ty Washington. Nice off the dribble pull up at the elbow. Good running the break, catch and shoot and transition. Uh, his foot was out of bounds though on that catch and shoot and transition, which was pretty sad. Uh, shot 57% from the floor. Uh, relies on that floater a ton, five rebounds and assist, eight points, 19 minutes. It's funny with Ty Ty Washington. I will say like every Rockets fan you talk to is so sad, like so sad that they give up on Ty Ty Washington. Like they like really like this guy, like really believe he can play. And oftentimes fans are the first to know a guy can't play. Like fans are the first to give up on a guy and say, Hey, he can't play. So like whenever Jackson Gatlin of Lockdown Rockets and like every Rockets fan account is like rooting for Ty Ty and thinking he's a really good player. It does it does stick out to me because like usually the local fan base, you guys are the smart ones of like, Hey, this guy can't cut it. And sometimes we're all wrong, including the fan base, but just a little nice little nugget for him. Uh, we'll talk Butler. I'm sure you guys have many questions on him. We'll talk about him later. Jemias Ramsey. I feel, I feel bad for the guy. Cause I did see like, as I've been telling you, G league scouts, you know, they, they, they don't really think that his stuff will transit to the NBA. It didn't even really translate here. Like some of the moves he was making. I, I know that like, if you hadn't watched in the G League before, you'd be like, why is he trying to do that? That stuff works for him in the G League. It just didn't work here, and it probably wouldn't work in the NBA. And so he's probably just like a heck of a G League player. And there's nothing wrong with that. He's probably just a heck of a G League player. Uh, KJ Williams was like just nothing in this game. Uh, didn't really do much. Uh, Zaire Smith, much like Jemias Ramsey, I don't really see how any of the stuff that he does can work in the NBA. But he didn't get any minutes really relatively at all in the summer league. So it's not really fair to him. As far as just suing and, and Daquan Plowden, I liked both of them as G League guys. Like, I don't think they have any chance of the NBA standard contracts or even a two-way deal probably, um, but they both have high motor. They both just get active. So I like that, and I, and I would love that energy in your G League program. But ultimately, this is just a really flat game. Two lead changes, four ties, 15-point lead by the Spurs. C. Sissoko was awesome tonight. Uh, the Thunder shot 46-31-77. That's kind of it. So that's why we pivoted and did your biggest takeaway. So thank you to everyone who 
who uh, sent in your takeaways. Let me know if you want this to be more of a routine thing. I know being a solo show, you know, we can get more of your takes on this. We can kind of go back and forth um, a little bit. So if you like this format, let me know on Twitter at Riley underscore styles. Let me know on YouTube uh, in the comments, wherever else you can find me. We've got many ways, including texting 405-963-3686, 405-963-3686. So tomorrow is all about you again. You guys just run the show. All about you, mailbag, drop the questions everywhere we just listed. You can drop them. We'll react to them. We'll answer them on tomorrow's podcast. So thank you all for listening. We're going to survive this off season. This is going to be the downtrodden time, but we're going to get through this together as basketball addicts. Until tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.